But what a great day it is to be in the Lord's house. I am so excited about chapter 2 of Genesis. So pray for me, because my goodness, I'm too excited. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to be able to gather together. Those of us with like faith, those of us who have come to know your son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior, Lord, we're blessed to be here with our brothers and sisters that we're going to share eternity with. I pray, Lord, that you would be with us, that your spirit would speak to our hearts and our minds, that you would mold us more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, that you might encourage and lift up our hearts so that we can worship you in spirit and truth. Be with every one of us, Lord. Be with the, the team up front and every person here and everyone online that we might see you for who you are and give you the praise that you so richly deserve. Guide us today, we pray. Lord, we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are back in the book of Genesis today, and we're in chapter 2. We're in Genesis, which I, I almost thought I had made a mistake, <laughs> because it's 50 chapters. And how are we going to get through 50 chapters? Well, we're going to do that a verse at a time, and we're going to do it with me not speaking a whole lot. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go through the most important aspects of what's going on and kind of editorialize as best as I can. Um, I had like 50 slides and it was way too much. I had to cut it down. So I, I will briefly go over probably some of your pet doctrines and that's okay. I, I believe that the scriptures are sufficient and uh, you should always leave a little something on the table for everyone else to find. So we're in the book of Genesis. Going back to what we looked at, we looked at creation, the six literal days of creation. They're not an allegory, not a simile, they're not a metaphor. They're six literal days of creation. So last week, we went through the sixth day when God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. There's something about male and female that are created in the image of God, not just male himself. And as you know, because woman was taken from the man's side, None of you men are all there. <laughs> so we looked at day six. Let us make man in our image and our likeness and have dominion over the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle. And we looked at all of that last week. If, if you want to get into that in depth, you can always go back. We have everything archived online and you can look at it. We looked at this wonderful parallelism between the creation. The first, the second, and third day, he was creating kingdoms. He was forming. And then the, la the last three days, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, he was filling those kingdoms. So you can see each one, and every kingdom has its king. And so we'll, we'll look at that, or we looked at that last week, rather. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. We are to have dominion, to dominate, to tread down, to subjugate, and to trample. It's the act of pulling grapes off of a vine, putting it in a vat, and trampling them. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. Take things and bring them into subjugation to the will of God. That's why we're here. That's some serious leadership, right? I don't know. It resonates with me. but. And we looked about how Jesus said we're to take this authority and bear it, which is with humility. We saw about the image of God and how we were created in his image, which is hugely important because if we forget that and if we think that we're just highly formed amoebas, then human life means nothing. Personhood means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. And your self-image, your inflated self-image is based on what? On your imagination? Because if you're just a highly formed amoeba, you mean nothing. But because you have a soul and because you have a spirit and you're made in God's image, there is a specialness to human beings. There is a value that is far beyond what it is that you do. It's far beyond your, your value as a provider or a protector or anything else that you do because you're made in the image of God. We talked about all of what this means to us because of the fall, you know, and because we're made in God's image, what does that mean for our evangelism, our work, our citizenship, and our ecology? How do we look at the earth, because that was our first job, is to take care of this place, right? You know, whether it's a little piece of paper on the floor that I see and I go, ooh, 
or whether it means something bigger, you know, taking the garbage out or actually being careful to recycle or whatever it means, it means that I need to be responsible for all of my activity and anybody that happens to be around me. Capiche? You guys capiching? I'm thinking of Carl, sorry. And we're to eat fruit and vegetables. Imagine that. Because that's why God put them here. And he makes them in all so many different flavors and colors and everything. And aren't you glad he didn't just set out pills in a, in a container? <laughs> Say, here you go. So this week, we're going to look at the formation of Eve. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Can I get an amen? amen. Mostly women, I hear that. Yes. <laughs> I will make him a helper who is suitable to him. And so we're gonna, that's part of what we're going to look at. Just to give you an overview, we're going to talk about the seventh day, which strangely enough is in chapter two because man is the one who chopped all this up. I believe it belongs in chapter one, don't you? So I am going to begin a new... No, I'm not going to do that. It's in the seventh day. Seventh day is beginning of chapter two. We're going to talk about the garden and some aspects of that. The full story of mankind's creation, because chapter one was kind of the overview, uh, just the facts, ma'am, sort of thing. And we get through the whole thing. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a closer look on day six and the creation of man and woman and the first marriage, which is the first in institution that God puts in place. So fasten your seatbelts. Thus, the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work in which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work in which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it, he rested from all the work in which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and the heavens. So it's kind of a, a, a closing to God's creative work and day seven. As we look at this, I want you to notice a couple of things. He says heavens, which are plural. By the way, there are three heavens, if you're not aware of that uh, from the scriptures, uh, just to give you an idea of what they look like. Number one is atmosphere. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God called the firmament heaven. Interesting. So we have sky those, those, where the birds fly. That's the first heaven, which God created. The second one we find in Psalm 19, one, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. The heavens are the sun, the moon, the stars, everything that's outside of that. That's the second heaven. So you have to be careful when reading through the scripture. You've got to know what heaven they're talking about. And number three is the place where God lives with the angels and the hosts of heaven. And that's the third heaven. Why do I call it the third heaven? Because the scripture does. Here in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul speaking of himself kind of in the third person says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up into the third heaven. And so we see there are three heavens. There's atmosphere and sky, and we see there's space, which is the final frontier. And then we see <laughs> heaven, which is really our final destination. Notice on the seventh day, there's no evening and morning. It doesn't say there was evening, there was morning, the seventh day. Ta-da, it's closed. That's probably just an accident. There are no accidents in the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit's very deliberate about what's put there and what's not put there. And when you notice that there's something there consistently and suddenly it's not, you've got to go, hmm. There's something about the seventh day that God wants us to notice, but we're not going to notice it until Christ comes. So here's the six days. There was morning and evening, one day. So, why? Makes you wonder, right? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> God rested? I mean, I know that Jesus slept in a boat. Uh, you know, God rested? What in the world does that mean? Was God tired? Do, do you think he was pooped? You have to say, why? Why would God rest on the seventh day? He just ran out of stuff to make? I don't think so. Have you seen zebras? <laughs> Koalas? You know, Gila monsters? I mean, there's some crazy stuff out there God made. So, was he tired? Was he weary? 
Was he just finished? Was it completed? Did he say enough? Or was it an example for us? It's a multiple choice question. You can pick any of those if you'd like. You can argue about it later. You guys are very non-vocal today. God created everything, and when he was done, he stopped doing any new creation that he was doing. That's the rest that he did. He set everything into motion, time, space, matter, acceleration, all the laws of physics and thermodynamics. Everything has been placed and put in place, and he's calling it quits. I'm done doing anything new. Isn't that something? Because you got, you know, there's got to be an end at some point. Like there are some people that sometimes will ask me, hey, Pastor Dave, you know, like, we were just wondering, how many children do you think we should have? And I think that's an awesome question, but why ask me? There's a time to quit. <laughs> well, we don't use any protection, and we just feel like God's going to continue to bless us. Yeah, he probably will. But there's nothing wrong with calling it quits. Just thought I'd share that with you for one application. The Sabbath day. This is what's called the Sabbath day. Now, we don't get to the Sabbath day until Moses comes around, but it's interesting because it was celebrated before that. Before it was codified and put into the law, into the Ten Commandments, as you know, it was celebrated and it was observed. We'll move on. In Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, by the way, if you're going to be a Sabbath keeper, it means you need a six-day work week. There's no weekend for you. Just letting you know. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. And by the way, you have to be finished by the sixth day. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger that's within your gates. That's to close up the loopholes. You get it. Everybody takes a break. You, you, you can't go next door and knock on the door of your Gentile neighbor and say, hey, my stove went out. Can you come and light it? You can't do that. <laughs> For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we get it codified all the way when Moses shows up many hundreds of years later. But you see, God ordained it. And then you'll say, well, but Jesus said in Mark 2, 27, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Pastor Dave, I don't understand what you're doing. <laughs> We're supposed to observe, observe the Sabbath, one and seven, to rest. God said so. He's pretty serious about it too. But then Jesus said, oh, you got it wrong. You're not serving the Sabbath. It's not about all these peculiar and particular things that the Pharisees made it into. It's about you getting a break. Who else would let people take a break other than God? Certainly not your boss. The Sabbath day rules are punishable by death. I want you to be so glad you're not in the Old Testament, people. Exodus 35, 2 and 3 says, Work shall be done for six days, but on the seventh day shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. By It's to the Lord, by the way. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. God believes in the death penalty. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. You're not even allowed to go chick, 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 and make a fire because that's effort. And you should be forethoughtful and make sure that your fire keeps burning. You can drop sticks in there and you can keep it going, but you can't start it if it goes out. And then it sucks to be you because you got no food, you got no heat, you got no light. <laughs> but it's punishable by death if you disregard it. Why? Because you're disregarding God. That's some pretty serious government right there. But you may say to me, but Jesus said, and he said to them, Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It's not about serving the Sabbath. It's not about these rules and regulations and making sure that we look good to everybody and, you know, God's not going to get mad at us and we don't get killed for starting a fire. It's about not disregarding God and his commandments. So, 
Sabbath day rules are punishable by death and enforced without appeal or mercy. In Numbers 15, 32 to 36, now while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man getting sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation. And they put him under guard because it had been explained what should be done to him. And then the Lord said to Moses, the man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones and he died. Aren't you glad you don't live under the Old Testament rule? And so this is what was written. The Sabbath was that important back then that you forfeit your life if you get busted. Here's the amazing thing. The two guys that found him gathering sticks and brought him, they would be the first two to throw stones at this guy. Would you be one of those inspectors that was just looking for people? What are you doing? What are, you, are you scratching your nose? Are you allowed to do that on the Sabbath? You know, would you, would you be an inspector? I don't know about you, but there are some people that are inspectors. Sometimes I'm an inspector. And I have to be careful because I will be the first one to have to put them to death. I will have to be the executioner. Isn't it better to just forgive? Yeah, that's just forgive. It's so much easier than killing somebody. But Jesus said... As the disciples were walking through, you might remember in Matthew, they were walking on their way to church, if you will, or Sabbath. They were on their way to temple. And they said, you know, we're kind of hungry. We didn't grab something before we left. And, you know, uh, Jesus likes to be early everywhere he goes. So these guys start pulling heads of grain off as they're walking through a field. And you're allowed to do this, by the way. And they were doing this and <laughs> blowing all the junk off. And then they were eating it. So they have a little granola snack on the way to church. Uh, or on the way to the temple. So as they were eating, the Pharisees spied them. And they came down on Jesus and said, your disciples are working on the Sabbath. You see, they risked their lives to do that. But when you're walking with Jesus, you don't really have much to worry about, do you? In Matthew 12, 5 to 7, Jesus trying to reason with them. And he says, or have you not read in the law on the Sabbath that the priests of the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one who is greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. He says, you guys, as priests, you got no problem working the whole Sabbath. By the way, it's a little hard for me to tell you on a Sunday, you got to take a break while I'm up here talking. There's a lot of work that went into this. Am I suddenly excused or is this a universal law? It's a universal law. Well, then why are the priests allowed to work? Hmm. Jesus brings up a very good point. The law was completed in Jesus and we are not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. Yes, and you should be very glad for that. How so? Think about it. There's no more priesthood. There's no more sacrifice. There's no more dietary laws. There are no more holy days and there are no more Sabbaths. Quiet fell upon the room that day. As Pastor Dave threw up this heretical thought. Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Jesus completed the law and did everything that happened and he had to sacrifice his life even though he did nothing wrong and he did that for you. It doesn't mean you should run out and be a banana head and do crazy things. It just means that you're no longer under the law. And there are some people that will take and they will cherry pick things out of the scriptures in the Old Testament and they'll say, oh, you gotta do this, you gotta do this because if you don't do this, you'll get killed. Really? You're gonna whack out about one particular thing? Well, you better take the whole thing you better take the whole thing. I mean, we better start keeping track of people's menstrual periods and see if they come to church or not, or if they bathe, or ceremonial washings. We, we need, to, we need to, the whole package. You can't just pick one thing out and say, I'm going to observe this to, to the death. 
Get over it. Jesus freed you from that. We live in a relationship now, not under regulations. And aren't you glad? I'm such a spoiled brat. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's why there isn't a morning and evening last day. Because we enter into the rest of Jesus Christ, which isn't only a 24-hour period. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if you think it's tough being a Christian, imagine what it was like to be a Jew under the law. Yes, his burden is light, absolutely. Regulations are replaced by relationship. So as we go through and we're reading about the Sabbath day and keeping it holy and you're not allowed to do any work and oh my goodness, this guy's picking up some sticks and that's it, he's, he's dead. Praise God for Jesus because we're not under the law. And God is not judging us on the basis of what we do. He's already judged us with his son. And we've been cleared even though we're unworthy of it. How do you feel about somebody else suffering for something you did? That kills me. Somebody else is going to suffer for what I did? That Oh, they thought you did that. No. Or suffering for somebody, something somebody else did. <gasps> That's even worse. But even while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Knowing every one of our sins and dying for all of them. That is a deep truth that we should never forget. In Corinthians, I'm sorry, Colossians 2, 13 to 17 says, and you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped away the handwriting of requirements. By the way, that's the law. The handwriting of requirements is the law that stands against you to judge you. That was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, meaning the cross. So let no one judge you in food. I don't hear anybody telling me I'm e e eating a bagel. There's a problem. I, let no one judge you in food or in drink or in regard to a festival or a new moon or... Sabbaths, plural, because there's a week that you have a Sabbath, and then there are Sabbath months, and then there are Sabbath years. Every 49 years, you got to let your land rest. Anyway, your jubilee, whole deal. Anyway, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is in Christ. You see, all of what we're seeing in the Old Testament, a lot of this is shadows and figures and stuff and similitudes so that we might understand who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. Okay, you're tracking. I'm good. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 9 to 13. And there remains therefore a rest, a Shabbat for the people of God. For he who has entered the rest has himself also ceased from the works as God did from his. By the way, when you come to Jesus Christ, you stop trying to be good enough. You stop that. You stop doing things that you, you, you think you have to do. You stop from all that and you take a rest and you rest in Christ. That's what he's saying. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. By the way, there's a diligence to enter it. That's probably the six days previous. Lest anyone fail according to the same example of disobedience as the people of Israel before them. And the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, not a judge of your behavior, judge of your heart. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open the eyes of him in whom we must give an account. So we live to be right with God in a relationship through Jesus Christ, which means we're free from the law doesn't mean that God's expressed will should not be obeyed, but it's not like, oh, I got to take a test. I hope I pass or I'm going to fail. You've already failed. Jesus knows you failed. He already gave you a diploma. It's done. 
So, have you entered the rest of Jesus Christ? Have you entered into the place where you know that your sins are forgiven because Jesus died for you? Have you given your life to him and said, listen, I'm a, I'm a worthless sap, and every time I try to do the right thing, I do the wrong thing, and, and all the good things that I want to do, I never get to. Romans chapter 7. I realized that day I needed Jesus Christ when I heard that passage. Amen. And I gave my life to him and it's made all the difference. So you might say, hey, let's get back to the text. Okay. <laughs> Verse five, we're flying. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. We're given this antediluvian weather report, okay? The, the, the pre-flood weather report. It's gonna be misty today. And that's the way it is. And it's interesting because when God separated the waters from the waters and he created atmosphere, we believe that there was a much thicker band around the earth that actually filtered out a lot of light. And it might be why people live so long back then. Um, it's conjecture, but it's something worth looking into. Uh, and there's actually some evidence of this in the fossil record. Did you know that if our atmosphere was not 200% denser than it is right now, a pterodactyl could not fly? I read too much. If our atmosphere was not 200% thicker than it is right now, a pterodactyl could not fly. It's a rather interesting thing to consider. Anyway, so there's lots of proof and I don't have time for it. So. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Don't you feel good, men, about who you are? You bag of dirt. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Wouldn't you like to have seen that? God fashions a body, a lifeless body, and he breathes into it much like you would somebody who you just rescued out of the ocean. He breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and man becomes a living being. Not just a created animal, more than an animal. Amen. We're made of earth. That means we have a connection to this place. And sometimes it's a bit heavier than it should be. Sometimes, oh my goodness, the news, what's going on? I have to check my, I'm sorry, Pastor Dave, you have to wait for a minute, I have to check my phone. What's going on? Elon Musk, what? And what? Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. I'm reading it upside down. Yeah, and here it is. Sometimes we have too much of a connection to this world and its priorities. But we have a connection to this place because we're made of that stuff. And it's interesting. There are about 17 different chemicals that make up the human body and they're not from outer space. They're from here. Every one of them, you can fit them in your hand, mostly water, but everything is right here in the earth. So people that say human beings came from another planet were just dropped here and they were seeded here like a colony. Tell them, well, then why are we made of the same stuff as the earth and not the moon or Mars or anything else? Hmm. <laughs> the breath of God. And so we are not just flesh. And we are not just soul, we are spirit. God has breathed into us an eternal spirit which will last forever. And that being joined with our body and our soul, we are eternal beings. We occupy this earth suit right now, but we won't forever. And we'll be given a new one where our soul and spirit will abide forever. One of two places. And we are a living being or a spirit more than a creature and less than God. God poured some of himself. He wasn't just creating, he was making offspring. And this is how God did it. And we know ultimately this is a picture. This is the first Adam. We know the second Adam is Jesus Christ who comes and does what the first Adam could not do. Amen. Live the perfect life. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward. By the way, anytime you see a direction, it's usually from Jerusalem or from Palestine, if you will, eastward. So that's... East, eastward of where? On the East Coast? No. Eastward of um, Palestine. And there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant in the sight and good for food. Notice it was pleasing to the eye and good for food. 
that's two out of three categories that the other two trees have something added to. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By the way, wasn't an apple. Apples don't grow in that part of the world. Really? So if people argue with you, they, hey, it wasn't an apple. You're right, it wasn't an apple. It was a fruit, by the way, the scripture says. We'll see that next week. So he planted this beautiful, idyllic place. It's heaven on earth, by the way. It's a picture from Maui. Idyllic place in the world. And he dropped man in the midst of all this. And man said, nice. Because it was good. And there were these two peculiar trees that are in the garden. One is the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil? Yeah, the knowledge of good and evil. And the other one was the tree of life. Tree of life. What does that mean? I'm sure you guys know better than I do. The tree of life. That which is going to lift you up and, and put you on a completely different plane than where you are right now. I believe Adam was created forever. He was created to regenerate. You notice you get a cut and it heals itself. You know any machine that'll do that? Try cracking up your car. Watch your car fix itself. It won't happen. <laughs> God created us to live forever. We messed it up and stepped off. Chapter 3, we'll talk about that. There are two trees in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There are some people think it was a particular fruit that did some molecular thing. And no. Anything not done in faith is sin. Anything that you can't do with a clear conscience before God, that's sin. That's the fruit, knowledge of good and evil. And now you know what evil is because you tasted it. And you know what good is because you lost it. Yep. That's the tree, knowledge of good and evil. <coughs> We're getting some coordinates. Now a river went out from Eden to water the garden. And from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first was the Pishon, one which skirts the whole land of Havilah. And there is gold. And for that reason, people tried to find the Garden of Eden. And the gold that was in that land is good. Bedellum and onyx stone are there, and the name of the second river is the Gihon, one which goes around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Hidichel. You might know it as the Tigris. There are some common uh, language bases which would indicate it's the Tigris. It is the one in which goes toward the, the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Notice the Euphrates gives the, no explanation as to what's around it or near it. Oh, yeah, the other one's the Euphrates, which you know. You understand? Didn't have to tell you anything about that because you know where the Euphrates is, right? Mm -hmm. It's the thing in Revelation that's going to dry up and the armies are going to go over. So watch for that. Anyway, the Bible says that it's somewhere over in this fertile crescent. And by the way, all the fossil records and scientists say, yeah, that's the origin of mankind, and that's where mankind came from. They can trace all your heritage back, and they can actually find out, wow, everything came from right in here. Isn't that interesting? Good science will always verify the truth of God's word. So here's the fertile crescent, uh, which, which you might have heard of. And you can see the rivers that are there, the Euphrates, the Tigris, and there are these other rivers. These are not mythical, allegorical, metaphorical, symbolic, or similitudes. These are real places. These are real rivers. There are people that take this and turn it into some kind of ethereal. You know, the Garden of Eden is like four streams. You need the stream of self-worth. You know, the people turn it into all this kind of bananas. It's a real place. It's really here on the map, and that's what Jesus is talking about, uh, in case if any of you are involved in that bananas stuff. So <laughs> Eden is going to be one of these two places, either at the head or the foot of where these rivers converge, uh, I Iraq, Iran-ish area, Kuwait-ish area, okay? And those are east of Canaan, which you can see over here on the left-hand side. So I'm going to tell you exactly where, where it is. It's inside that red circle. That's where the Garden of Eden is, right inside that red circle. So if you need a definite answer, there it is. It's in that red circle on the map. Number two, it's gone. It's off the map. But we'll see it later. Because if you remember, there's a worldwide flood that comes and wipes everything out. Rivers are not the same. Streams are not the same. Great lakes are not the same. Animals are not the same. It's interesting, you have this one layer throughout the entire earth with fossils. You don't find them from top to bottom. You find them in a layer. Why would you find a bunch of dead animals all encased in mud in one layer? A worldwide flood. You need perfect conditions to get fossils because we're not making any new ones, by the way. 
we die, we degrade, we become dust, it's all over. The only way that you're gonna get animals fully formed like this in the mud is if you have a worldwide flood. Make sense? Just thought I'd throw that in there for argument's sake. Verse 15, the Lord God took man and he put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. That's our job. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely. That's nice. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Well, that sounds pretty serious. Guess what? We have choice. Suddenly, human will and choice now comes up on the scene. Because before, everything was perfect. No choice, no test. Everything's good. You're living in paradise, eat whatever you want, go wherever you want, whatever. But there's one tree that you shouldn't touch. Just one. And we couldn't handle it. So man says, okay. God ordained work before the fall, by the way. So if you say, I can't wait to go to heaven so I don't have anything to do and I can retire and get an easy chair and watch TV. That's not heaven, boys and girls. That's lethargy. It's laziness. So God ordained work before the fall, and so we should take it seriously like a ministry. And it doesn't matter what you do, it's a ministry. You should take it as such. Preserve and protect is what we're supposed to do. That's why God put us here. Preserve and protect. To care for it and make sure that nobody messes with it. That's what we're supposed to do. So, somebody's breaking into your neighbor's house, I don't want nothing to do with that, Pastor. I'm not gonna, you should take ownership of the people around you. You should take care of the people that are around you. You see somebody, you know, stumbling and falling on their way in, you just go, well, I'm gonna stand back because, you know, I wanna watch this. Let me get my phone out. <laughs> and that's what people do, because my goodness, we, sh we can make money on the internet with that. I'm sorry, forgive me, I go off. You can eat any fruit. So where's Dave Loyley? <laughs> I can eat any fruit, Dave. Eat any fruit, because that's what God said. And except for one. There's one fruit I'm not supposed to eat from, and that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The penalty is death, instant spiritual and progressive physical death. God didn't elaborate that, but we see in chapter three what happens. We lose paradise, we lose fellowship, we lose innocence. And it's, it's the thing that you can only do once, and it's gone. The penalty is death. Instant spiritual separation from God and progressive physical death. We're gonna see that when we get to chapter three. Also, it's the death of your free will. Free will is the interesting thing. You know, we think, oh, well, we have the ability. I have two trees. I have the freedom to choose either one of these. You do until you choose the wrong one, and then you no longer have freedom. You're a slave. It's addiction. Perhaps you've heard of it. John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. If you reach out and you take that fruit, you'll be a slave to it. And guess what? Every one of us, before we meet Jesus Christ, is a slave to our sin. Your human will, your freedom of will has been taken away and has been subverted by something else, by evil itself, and we chose that. So don't complain about the world. If it was you in the garden, you would have done the same thing. In Romans chapter six, verses 16 and 18, it says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that you are that one's slaves to whom you obey, whether to sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine of which you were delivered, delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You see, when we come to Jesus Christ, we come to the tree that isn't the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Jesus Christ is that tree. And we're gonna see this tree in chapter 22 of Revelation. Acts 5, 30 and 31 says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Isn't it interesting that Jesus hung on a tree? And it doesn't say a cross, it says a tree. You see these things and wonder. 
Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. They hung Jesus on a tree. The judgment that came from us eating that tree was poured out on Jesus by hanging on a tree. You understand? The only way that that book could be written is if you knew the end from the beginning. The only way that these things can parallel together is if God constructed all of time and scripture. Another one in 1 Peter 2, 24 to 25, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray and have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Give me an amen if that's the case. Amen. amen. You are no longer a slave to sin, guys and girls, if you've come to know Jesus Christ. Your, your will has now been reinstated. Praise God for that. And the Lord God said, it is not good the man should be alone. All the ladies aren't going to say amen. amen. It's, <laughs> I will make him a helper compatible to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each creature, it was its name. And so Adam gave names to the cattle, the birds of the air, and every beast of the field. But for Adam was not found a helper comparable to him. This seems strange. The Lord God, by the way, I want, to, I want you to notice it says Lord God. It doesn't say God anymore. It says Lord God. There's a new name for God now here. Jehovah, which is a relationship name. It's not just Elohim, creator. It's a relationship name. It's now being added because human beings have been added to the mix. Just thought I'd point that out. Small thing, I know. Alone is not good. By the way, because you remember, six days, right? It's good. It's very good. <laughs> and God rested. Well, turns out before it was very good, there was something not good. And it's the only thing God ever says is not good is that man is alone. It's probably because of his video addiction. It's not good that man is alone. <laughs> Teenage boys, their insurance rates are super high because insurance companies know the stats. It is not good for a man to be alone. <sighs> anyway, so he said, I will make a comparable helper. By the way, that, that is the comparable helper to the video crazed maniac of man. A comparable helper. But it's interesting, before God does that, he stops and he gathers all the animals and he says, Adam, what do you think? <laughs> I think I'll call that elephant. An elephant has something to do with this large trunk, by the way. Rhinoceros, rhinoceros, the name actually has something to do with the large spike on his nose. And so basically he's identifying morphological identifying, identifying issues with these animals and he's naming them after that. There's a zebra, there's a possum, there's a, he's naming all the animals. But as he's doing that, there's a male and female zebra. There's a male and female giraffe, there's a male and female rhino. There's a male and female, male and female, male and female, male and female. The reason God showed him all those creatures is so that he would know there was no one like him. Don't look for fellowship in any of these animals too deeply. They don't have a spirit. They're not like a wife. It's an animal. Just so that you understand, I think what God was saying was, you're not complete and you know it. And now I'm glad you do because I'm going to fix that. Before providing a man's need, God reveals his need of fellowship to him. Isn't it interesting? Sometimes you'll notice you have a lack in your life and you say, I don't know why God's made this lack in my life. Well, it could be that he wants you to realize that you have a lack in your life and then you'll appreciate the thing that you lack once it comes. I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud. And so there's man alone and we leave him alone without anyone comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And as he slept, and he took one of his ribs 
and he closed up the flesh in its place and the rib in which the Lord God had taken out of the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Oh, Lord, help me. So he causes Adam to go into a deep sleep. By the way, in the New Testament, you know what sleep means? It means you're dead. I never thought of that. Maybe he had to put Adam way under. Killed him. So that he could open him up. Or maybe it meant sleep. But it's interesting, the, the, the ancient rabbis write that they believe that Adam died at this point to give birth to the woman. And that's very interesting because if that's the first Adam, what did the second Adam do? He died to give birth to his bride. I'm just thinking out loud. And so this deep sleep may have been a deep sleep deeper than we understand. And it says deep sleep. Physical removal of a side, by the way, it's not a rib of the man. It's not an individual bone piece. It's a side more rightly uh, taken from Hebrew. It's a side of the man. Which side of the man? The female side, of course. So men, if you want to get in touch with your feminine side, call your wife. <laughs> and Eve now creates this hole inside of man where there's this place it can be said of man that he is not officially all there. And he's not complete and he's not good without the woman. You women are saying, that's right. Leave my husband alone. I don't know what he's going to do. I confess. That's why I'm glad I have a savior because I'm never alone. They are Ish and Isha. <laughs> ish, that you? Yeah, it's Ish. <laughs> Ish is man and Isha is woman. And throughout all the languages you will find, it's like that, like man and woman, you will find that the words are very much the same. And it's interesting, apparently he was on a naming, uh, you know, craze when he woke up. What's he do? The first thing he does is say, ah, oh, there's a creature I haven't named. I will call her woman. Zebra, rhino, elephant, meet woman. And so he names her woman. Interesting. A bride came from Adam's side and Jesus also purchased a bride by a wound in his side. If you remember. So there are lots of corollaries between Adam and Jesus on purpose. And the only way you could do that is if you were God and you knew the end from the beginning. Amen. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he, meaning Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we're healed. The church is called the bride of Christ and it took Jesus suffering and a wound in his side to give birth to a bride as well. I thought that was interesting. Therefore, I think this is the last slide. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Don't worry, it's not going to get pornographic in here. And they were both naked. Oh, I lied. <laughs> they both were naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Yes. This is the first institution that God sets up is marriage. Isn't it interesting? He says, a man shall leave his father and mother Who's Adam going to leave? He's not saying leave God. You see, God is setting down an eternal principle that's going to transcend time. It's going to transcend this relationship. You see? And we have it preserved here for us. There's four elements here. And this, by the way, is what will constitute a marriage. And if you do any marriage counseling, we'll make sure we go over this passage. You leave, you cleave, you become one, you get naked and unashamed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I know, you, I know you do. You were well taught. First, exit. Get the heck out. 
what a man needs to do is make a separation with his parents. Why? Because they will meddle. There's a new paradigm. There's a new authority structure. There's a new world. A man and his wife are going to create a new family. And so you are not to be under the authority or the meddling of parents. Parents, sorry. Sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> this is what marriage is. Two people, leave them alone. Let them figure it out. Let them make mistakes. Don't sit there and hover over them. Don't do it. You exit, you leave. Number two, you cleave, like that wonderful sloth. <laughs> cleave means take effort and energy to pursue men. You don't get married and then become the king of the remote and then forget your wife. You cleave, and by the way, that's a demand to you as the man, not the woman. You pursue your wife with energy and effort. I do so, and I have to because I gotta get up here and teach this. I have date night with my wife every Friday night <laughs> with energy, effort, and financing. I pursue that woman. I buy her stuff. And I invest in our relationship because I can't afford a divorce. A lot of people hunt and hunt and they use all, they go online and they look for somebody. Oh, I don't know. That. No, I don't want that one. Let's look for them. They spend energy and effort and they pursue and they look and they finally find someone and then there's all the inevitable planning of the wedding and oh, it's so exciting. She's so beautiful. <laughs> you get married and you go home and then he leaves the toothpaste cap off and you go, dude, could you put the cap on? What's going, your underwear's on the floor. What is the, listen, it takes energy and effort to pour into a relationship, you need finances, you need time, you need heart, you need all of these things to make a marriage work. It's like a garden. You don't throw seeds on the ground and say, I have a garden. <laughs> Especially if it's on your front lawn and it looks like mine and it's all hay right now because we haven't had rain in weeks. I have a garden. No, you don't. You have seeds dying on the ground and the birds are gonna come and take them. Okay, plow up the ground, put the seeds in, water it, make sure it's in a good place that it gets sunlight. Make sure you pay attention because the birds will come in and eat the fruit before you do. The, the rabbits will come in, put a fence around it, put something over the top of it. You pick the bugs off of it. You make sure it's defended. You look for blight. You look for signs of it. That's a garden. It takes time and effort and energy. And he says, cleave unto your wife. That's what it looks like. Sorry if I went on too long. And you become one flesh. This is not the physical union necessarily. It means everything that's mine is hers and everything that's hers is mine. There's no mine and yours. There's no my bank account, your bank account, my car, your car, my room, your room, my children, your children, my debt, your debt, my credit card, your credit card, it's ours. It's ours. Everything is ours because it's a three-legged race and you got to work together, right? You don't just go out and buy a brand new car and you don't tell your mate, what are you, a bonehead? You're in a three-legged race. You're going to chafe your ankle really bad or you're going to break the bond. That's what it means to become one. It means everything that's mine is yours. Yours is mine, including family, including friends, including your past, including your wounds, including your mental illnesses, including all of it. It's all mine. It's all yours. It's ours. Okay? Number four, they were naked and unashamed. I couldn't put something up like nakedness. <laughs> it means there's openness, honesty, accountability. No secrets. No secret life, no secret money, no secret purchases, no secret relationships, no secret conversations. There's no secrets. You're completely open and naked, which is a euphemism for being completely open and honest. That's what a relationship requires. That's what marriage is. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. <laughs> it's not about lying. Lying will absolutely take the legs out from a relationship because now you can't be trusted. And trust is the foundation of everything else that you build on. If you don't have that, then you can't build on it. 
and you have to restore it. That's why Jesus said the only reason for divorce that is even remotely accessible is adultery. That's lying because you said that you would choose her forever. You said you would choose him forever. And by the way, something else about marriage, it's monogamous, it's forever, and it's male leadership. Amen. Well, it's easy for you to say, Pastor. No, the scripture says so. And I don't have time to show you all of it. But if you want to talk about it, I'd be glad to help you. And here it is, Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands, not everyone's husband, your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as, Christ, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Uh, any of you single ladies think very carefully about getting married. Husbands, notice all the rest that's for husbands. Because it's not good for us. Husbands, love, that means unconditionally lay yourself down, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So a perfect marriage is a submissive wife with a self-sacrificing husband. Capiche? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. By the way, that's the responsibility of the man. That he might present her to himself. A glorious church, not having any spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. By the way, if you don't like the way your wife looks, it's your fault. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. By the way, that's where she came from, right? Eve came from Adam, right? You, you, you follow me? Yeah. Okay. The husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, and he who loves his wife loves himself, because that's where she came from. No one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it. <laughs> I'm applying this to myself. I hope you are. Just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and his flesh and his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. That's what marriage is. And it's not easy. And it takes somebody who's submitted to God. Otherwise, you're going to do whatever you feel like doing. And it's not good that man's alone. I will make him a helper compatible for him. Praise God. And I'm so glad for that. Now, I didn't talk about the blessing of what it is to be single that Paul talks about. I haven't talked about the gift of singleness, which is definitely a gift. The Lord can fill that empty space with himself. Amen, ladies? Yeah. I don't need no man. It's not that spirit. <laughs> it's God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. That's what it means. So, I hope you guys are enjoying going through Genesis. There are lots of foundational truths here. And I would hope that the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart about something. This is a good time for you to solidify it in your heart. A good time for you to make a commitment to God to kind of choke up on the bat, so to speak. Amen.